Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to another episode at Ed America TV. My name is James, one of the e guys here at Ed America, and we welcome our audience members joining us online. We hope that you're doing well and staying safe. Ed America is the U.S. Embassy's American Center, and our mission is to provide a space for young Indonesians to learn more about the United States. We have temporarily moved to a solely digital platform so that you guys could enjoy us from the comforts of your own home. In this episode, we'll be having what's happening with our reefs. But before we begin, I have here a question for all our audience. The following are types of coral reefs except, and the options are A, fringing, B, barrier, C, Amazon, and D, atoll. Stay tuned until the end of this program because we'll be giving a live shout out to whoever can answer correctly on our social media. Also, don't forget to take a picture to take a selfie and tag at America's Instagram account. Now, before I invite our moderator for today, I would like to show everyone a opening remark from Rachel Cook, the Acting Deputy Chief of Mission from the U.S. Embassy, Jakarta. Good afternoon and Salamat Siang. Thank you for joining today's At America program on what's happening with our reef. We are excited to have some dynamic experts in coral reef conservation to discuss the current state of reefs globally and in Indonesia, and advances in science that can help protect these fantastic natural resources. I welcome Dr. Mary Hagedorn from the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, Emilio De La Rosa from Rare Indonesia, Nyoman Sugiarta from Pokmaswas, Sila Kartika Sari from Reef Check International, and Nesha Ichida from Divers Clean Action. I loved studying marine biology in college and went on to study environmental management in graduate school. I've been a diver and a reef lover since I was a teenager, and I know that coral reefs are essential for healthy ocean ecosystems and for a healthy planet. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world, providing habitat, food, and shelter for more organisms than any other marine environment. And this is especially significant for Indonesia, which sits at the center of the coral triangle which is the global epicenter of marine biodiversity. Fish make up an estimated 40% of all animal protein in the Indonesian diet, making healthy reefs critical to regional food security. Fish are also an important component of the Indonesian economy, exporting 4.49 billion US dollars worth of fish in 2019. Sadly, illegal, unreported, and unregistered fishing continues to be a major threat to coral reef health and results in three to five billion US dollars in economic losses to Indonesia's economy every year. That's between 44 and 74 trillion Indo Indonesian rupiah, threatening both local livelihoods and food security. Other threats to reefs include building upon reef structures by various actors, pollution, and habitat destruction. Climate change also poses a major threat to coral reef survival as warming waters and increased carbon in the ocean make it harder for reef life to survive and flourish. I am proud to say that the United States has a strong history of supporting the government of Indonesia's efforts to combat illegal, unreported, and unregistered fishing, and to conserve its incredible coral reefs. Thanks to a U.S.-Indonesia partnership, 14 marine protected areas were established and strengthened in North Maluku, Maluku, and West Papua that protect coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass ecosystems which in turn, of course, support the daily life of those coastal communities. Marine conservation faces a special challenge because anything covered by water is out of sight. If 
you can't see what lies beneath, you may not know uh, or easily realize the full impact humans are having. I challenge you to take to heart what today's speakers share with you. Look below the surface. See the life-sustaining, awe-inspiring treasure that the ocean offers and take action to preserve it. Thank you and makasih. All right, now that we've all seen that opening remark, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today, Nesha Ichida, co-founder and advisory board of Diverse Clean Action. Hi, everyone. Um, hope everyone can hear me very well today. Uh, thank you so much for having me as a moderator for this event. I'm super excited, especially being a marine conservation biologist. I, I love the ocean and I love coral reefs. Um, and I'm super excited for the panelists that's going to be speaking today because they're from a whole different range of backgrounds from the local communities that are actually um, protecting them on the front line to the world experts that are uh, studying them from years and years. Uh, the talking points for today would be the threats to coral reefs, the challenges to the marine conservation towards coral reefs, even local efforts and environmental activism, and what are the, pro the prognosis in the future for our uh, reefs. So without further ado, I would like to introduce all our panelists. Uh, the first one is Dr. Mary Hagedorn. She received her PhD in marine biology from Scripps Institute of Oceanography and has been a research scientist at the Smithsonian Institute Institution for the past 17 years. Wow. She has worked in aquatic ecosystems around the world from the Amazons to Africa, has taught many university level classes and lectures frequently to lay audience. In the past year, she has received several research grants from the National Institute of Health to support her research and collaborate uh, in over 30 institutes uh, throughout the world. In 2000, she received the prestigious George E. Burst Fellowship in Theoretical Medicine and affi Affiliated Theoretic Sciences and was nominated for the Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation. Her passion and dedication to coral conservation is the driving force behind the Reef Recovery Initiative. Now our second speaker is Emilio De La Rosa. He is currently fisheries coordinator at Rare Indonesia. He graduated from Pajajaran University in general biology in 2014 and, and continued his studies at Institute Pertanian Bogor for his master's taking coastal and marine resource management. Emil has a degree also as a dive control specialist. He also volunteered to be a research assistant for WCS, World Wildlife Conservation Society. He's also currently an assistant instructor at Pura Besi Nusantara teaching an open water diver. And our third and fourth speaker will be sharing a presentation. The first one is Pak Nyoman Sugiata. Pak Nyoman and his team carried out several activities in marine protected area, including overfishing, the use of fish banks, monitoring the condition of coral reefs, rehabilitating reefs, and educating the community, fishermen, and school students about the importance of coral reef ecosystems. He is basically on the front line of protecting these coral reefs, and he's one of the most important people out there to support. The movement of Pak Nyoman and his team in Bonda Bondalem village inspired neighborhood villages that eventually also initiated the fish bank idea. Pak Nyoman believes that as humans, we, take, we have taken too much from the sea, and this is the time we can give back Panyoman dedication and enthusiasm earned him the 2014 Coral Conservation Prize given in San Francisco, California at the 20th anniversary gala. And our last speaker is Mbak Sila Kartikasari. Mbak Sila took a position with Reef Check Indonesia in 2017, part of the International Non-Governmental Organization of Reef Check Indonesia uh, International, as a Knowledge and Data Management Coordinator. Her responsibilities include organizing coral reef health monitoring for the Reef Check Network Indonesia, one of the biggest and most sustainable volunteer national monitoring networks in Indonesia since 1997. I personally have done one of these volunteering and it's super cool. 
Um, Restack Indonesia facilitate collaboration between multiple stakeholders to develop collaboration models in managing coastal and marine resources and has become the implementing partner of the USAID Sustainable Ecosystem Advance project in Morotai, North Maluku from 2016 and 2019. Well, without further ado, I've been talking so much. Let's um, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Mary Hagedorn. Thank you so much, Nisha. Um, I, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I've been doing for the past um, 16 years here in Hawaii. And we've developed a, a global bank for coral reefs. And so I'm going to talk mostly about sperm freezing. We, we, we do a wide variety of different types of cryopreservation on coral reefs. But today we'll just be talking about coral sperm and I'll be showing you a number of videos about that and why it's important to think about um, repositories for coral reefs. So I'm going to start sharing um, and can everyone see that? Is that okay? Yeah? Can you, can everyone see that? Okay, okay, perfect. All right, so as everyone has already said and Rachel Cook gave an amazing talk. I don't even know why we're here. She we just left her talking. We, we don't have to do anything. It was an incredible introduction, really. Very knowledgeable and I think very um, poignant. And so as, as she was saying, you know, coral reefs are among the oldest and most diverse ecosystems on our planet, but in every ocean they are under siege. So there's not a single coral reef in any of our oceans that have not been touched by local and global threats. Um, and as everyone will say, you know, and, and, and talk about, you know, sort of conductivity to the ocean, we live on, a, on an ocean planet and it produces greater than 50% of our oxygen for us. Coral reefs are, are one of the most important ecosystems in our oceans and um, it produces, um, it, is, it provides homes for almost one quarter of all marine life on the planet. So that's an incredible, even though they're very small in terms of the area they take up, it's an incredible multiplier that coral reefs, you know, do in terms of taking care of uh, our, our fish and other animals that live on reefs. They're also a source of potential medicines such as antibiotics and cancer um, and HIV um, AIDS drugs. Uh, they form natural storm barriers for coastlines and homes protecting over 200 million people worldwide. I benefit from that here in Hawaii because we have a reef that protects us during a number of tsunamis. They also at least 15, sorry, 500 million people depend on them for their livelihoods, such as food and fishing and tourism. Reefs contribute approximately $350 billion annually, that's US, to the global economy. So they're very important in how we live. And um, if they fail, our life on earth will, will be very um, uh, devastated by reef failure. So there are a number of things that are currently threatening reefs, as um, Rachel Cook mentioned, they're both local and global causes, such as overfishing um, and pollution and sedimentation. There's many, many threats. I just picked out two or three of them. Uh, other people will talk about them as well. But then there are global threats, and these are the things that are threatening every reef on Earth, even if there's no people there. And that is our overuse of fossil fuels driving our cars, uh, making cement. Um, there's a whole list of things where we use overuse fossil fuels that puts carbon dioxide in the air, which causes our oceans to warm and acidify. But most importantly, th this combined threat causes coral to stress, to bleach, which I'll talk about in a second, often get diseases and causes reproductive loss and death. And so this is not a, a you know, a scenario you want to see for coral reefs um, in terms of uh, threats. So since about 1980, the number of bleaching events that have happened on coral reefs have been increasing. And what is, what is bleaching? If you look at that small picture, you can see that there's a coral that looks white. And, and basically it's, it's not dead, but we're looking through its tissue. It's the, the thing that gives coral its amazing color are, are algal um, symbionts that live inside the coral tissue and help feed them. When they stress, they can, they can kick out the, the algal symbionts and it makes them look bone white. Um, if they don't get these algal symbionts back within about 10 weeks, 
then they will die. Um, and as you can see in the picture, this is the same species, but some individuals are, are susceptible to bleaching and others are less so, and some species are more robust. But when you look at what's been happening on reefs since, say, the 1970s, we now have many species on the endangered species list here in the US and also on the IUCN red list. There's over 100, I think, on the IUCN red list. Um, but when you, when you think about what happened before we even had you know, really severe effects of global climate change. Almost 50% of the, of the Great Barrier Reef died between 1984 and about uh, 2010. And that had to do with crown of thorns, starfish, um, basically eating the reef. And, and also 95% of the reef building coral in the Caribbean died before climate change. All of these were local causes. So these are things that people could have changed in their communities and they didn't. And so I think this is a really important thing to think about is that a lot of the huge changes we've seen on race have to do with local causes. And if we can take care of those local causes, we can, we can help reefs tremendously. Um, and um, so because of global climate change, coral reefs and marine protected areas are equally at risk. Like the, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, no one lives there, but they are equally all right, so in terms of, I mostly use technology for conservation, and there's, I, I just pulled a number of, of examples of technology, such as satellite tracking and drones, uh, live camera feed, DNA analysis, and what I use, which is cryopreservation, and that's going to be what I'm going to tell you about today. So we use human fertility techniques to, um, to help save coral reefs, and we've taken um, freezing sperm and freezing coral larvae. Um, and a number of other techniques to try and save them. We then put them into banks, we put the sperm into banks and they can stay there for tens of years up to hundreds of years. So species can be maintained in, as sperm in these banks for many, many years. What's important when we think about, you know, creating, using technology to help coral reefs is that we think about the genetic and biodiversity of coral reefs, they must be saved. And cryopreservation can really help do this. So first and foremost, I think many of you know that coral reefs are animals. Corals are animals. But they, one of the important things that I use is reproduction. And I wanted to show you what corals look like when they reproduce. Now, corals are hermaphrodites. That means they produce eggs and sperm. And, and the, these bundles that you see going up are egg. They're called egg sperm bundles. But some corals produce only sperm. This is a mushroom coral producing only sperm. And this is a brain coral producing egg sperm bundles all at once. So there's many different ways that corals reproduce, but many of them are through this, this com combination of egg sperm bundles. In my laboratory we, um, in Hawaii, or when we go into the field, we'll often take a fragment and we'll allow it to spawn and the egg sperm bundles rise to the surface. And then we, pick, we can then take them off the surface and collect them. And then after about 30 minutes or so, the eggs and, and sperm fall apart and you have sperm on the bottom, which you see at the, at the which is that sort of milky substance at the bottom of the um, tubes. And then the eggs are at the top. So we pull the sperm off and we begin to freeze it. This is very similar to what we do in you know, a human fertility lab. We then assess the sperm. We look to see how modal it is. And if, it's, if it has good motility, then we start the freezing. And we had to develop all our own methods for doing this. We actually developed the field of coral cryobiology. We developed all our own tools. And here you can see some of the kinds of freezers that we use. They're very inexpensive. We made them so that every person, any professional on earth could afford them. And the one on the right now is a 3D printed one that we've used in just, a, you know, in a, like a, a doer, a small uh, class. So most of the things that we use are less than $100 and um, uh, can be used to freeze sperm. So today we have over 48 species around the world that have been cryopreserved. And um, if you look um, on the, you see Caribbean coral, Hawaiian coral, coral from French Polynesia, the Gulf of Mexico, and many from the Great Barrier Reef, but hopefully someday we'll have some from Indonesia as well. So when we want to keep coral, the coral sperm for a very long period of time, we will store it in my lab for, a, for, for say, a, you know, a couple of months. But this is the kind of facility that allows you to maintain um, frozen material for wildlife for tens of years, hundreds of years. This is the USDA 
um, Animal Germplasm Repository in Collins, Colorado. And they've held our coral sperm um, for many, many years. And one of the things that we can do with the sperm is we can thaw it, just like you can thaw human sperm and use it to make new babies. We do the same for coral. This is a coral that we produce um, using um, cryopreserved and thawed sperm. And you can see the coral, there's three little polyps. It ha they have tentacles and it has its, its skeleton, it's, it's growing, and the, the brown spots are its symbiont. So it's completely normal looking. So um, one of the other things that we've been working on, and I, this is just a nod to trying to do things that can help our local reefs, is we're, um, we're building nurseries. And many people around the world are doing that. It's a real boom in the in the Caribbean right now is building nurseries. And um, one of the things that's great about nurseries, this is our nursery in French Polynesia. We built it uh, a year and a half before this picture was taken. And all those specks in the water are the coral spawning. So nurseries can really help us, you know, to inc increase the number of coral on the reefs and they can help, even when you have storms and things like that, nurseries can really be a good aug um, augmentation for coral reefs. And so, um, what I'm going to show you now is, is a film that we did about using frozen sperm to try and help the coral in the Caribbean. The coral, in, especially in Florida, do not have a lot of, of genetic diversity. And we're, we're working with the endangered coral, um, the Elkhorn coral, a cropper of Palmata. And we did this thing called assisted gene flow. And I'm going to just show you the, the video because it explains the whole thing. Coral are a fundamental ecosystem in our oceans. We really need to save them. They're really critical for life on Earth. My name is Mary Hagedorn, and I work on coral conservation and preservation. We've been applying human reproductive techniques, like freezing sperm, to coral, and it allows you to preserve those cells for a year or hundreds of years. We are going to thaw sperm that's been in our banks for over 10 years and use them on Fresh cure. Sorry. I guess I'm having difficulty with my, my video. Um, but I'll tell you the, the, the end of the story <laughs> is that um, we created uh, crosses between Curacao, Florida, and Puerto Rico. And here you can see. We are collecting eggs and sperm from Curacao, and we used our sperm, the sperm that we had collected over tens of years um, that had been frozen. We shipped it to Curacao, and we fertilized the eggs. And we didn't know if this if this species um, would still, because we're, we're fertilizing over hundreds of kilometers. And the whole goal was to see if we could use cryopreserved sperm to do this. Now, the idea, although it's probably not that important in Indonesia, because we still have a lot of biodiversity. And genetic diversity, but the Caribbean is very depauperate, and the whole goal really was to try and get um, uh, genetic to improve the genetic diversity of the, the, the coral in Florida. And could we bring some of those genes from Curacao to help us with that? And so we uh, ended up making thousands of these. It's called assisted gene flow, and it's really just a way of selective breeding. We didn't make any genetic monsters. They're, 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 everything's very normal. It's just that they wouldn't normally meet each other um, because they're hundreds of kilometers apart. And so um, we made hundreds of these coral babies, and they're now over a year and a half old and, and in Florida. And the, the goal would be to then um, uh, get these corals back out onto the reef once the managers and everyone was happy with, those, with, the, um, with the coral. And uh, so that would be our goal. And obviously, it would, our hope would be that it would help diversify some of the reefs in Florida, which are very, very different. Some of the reefs, like if you go down to Florida Keys, some of the keys only have one single genetic individual on it, you know, which is, I mean, it's probably hard for you to imagine in Indonesia, but um, it's, it's, it's very bad in Florida. So, um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. And um, I'll say thank you. And we'll look forward to uh, questions with in, in, in the uh, future.
Thank you so much, Dr. Hagedorn. Um, I find it so fascinating that you're doing assisted gene flow. Um, the fact that it's such a novel approach at the moment, and I had the opportunity to even look at the lab in Australia where doing, they're doing the same thing. They're combining the corals that are more high temperature, high temperature tolerant to the ones that are low temperature tolerant because they're on the verge of like extinction for these corals. So the fact that in Indonesia, you still have a lot of biodiversity, let's protect it before we have to go through all these extreme measures. Um, so our next speaker is Emilio De La Rosa. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, let me share my screen. All good, looks good. Hello, my name is Emil, uh, and I work in an organization that believes uh, human behavior is the cause and also the solution to the conservation challenges. That is why our mission is to inspire change so people in nature thrive. And we are red. Uh, allow me to tell you a little story about Paul and the St. Lucia parrot. So back in the 1970s, uh, the St. Lucia parrot is on the brink of extinction. Uh, because of deforestation, poaching. So Paul uh, embarked on multiple conservation campaigns to inspire behavior change uh, in the people in St. Lucia so they could emotionally connect with the bird and accept it as their collective identity. Now, Paul's campaigns were replicated as a behavior change campaign known as Rare Pride Campaigns. Today, most of Rare's work is aimed at addressing the crisis of declining small scale fisheries. We work in around 10 countries, including Brazil, Mozambique, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Pacific Islands, uh, Myanmar, uh, some countries uh, alongside the Mesoamerican Reef. Uh, we work in these countries because uh, their populations are highly dependent on their coastal fisheries, especially the reef fisheries for food, uh, for employment, and as a part of a productive economy. Unfortunately, those coral reefs are under threats. I want to uh, tell you a short story about how those coral reefs are under threats. So imagine this, there's a pasture, it's green, and there are only a few sheep eating peacefully on the pasture. The sheep reproduce and their number grows, and they're still eating in the same pasture. But as you can see, the pasture is no longer green and healthy. It's starting to become degraded. As the sheep population keeps on rising, uh, the pasture can no longer support the sheep because there's just too many sheep on the pasture and the pasture don't have time to recover. Eventually, the pasture would be totally degraded and the sheep themselves is in danger of starvation. Now, uh, this is what we call as the tragedy of the commons, where the natural resources uh, in this illustration, the pasture, the grass can no longer support the users because the users tend to exploit the resources without any control. This tragedy is also happening with our reefs. Coastal overfishing is a tragedy and a serious threat to our reef where we exploit our reef resources without any control and without any adequate management. Unsustainable fishing practice also threatens our reef. Uh, you can see uh, in the picture where they, the use of destructive fishing methods like glass fishing, uh, using homemade explosive and cyanide fishing, using dangerous chemical could poison the reef. Those threats are made complex by various conditions and challenges in Indonesia. First one is the diversity uh, of life in Indonesia, especially in the coral reef ecosystem. The diverse life in coral reefs is a gift, but it also makes things uh, more complex, especially when we have to manage not only one type of fish, as you can see in the picture, but many kinds of fish at the same time and at the same location even. Now, the use of many types of fishing gear also adds to the complexity. There are fishers, like in the picture, uh, like uh, Pambilu who use uh, fish traps, or there are fishers like Patono who, who use handlines and hooks, or fishers like Anur Sudin, who used spear, spear gun to catch fish, and many kinds of other 
fishing gear that, that is used to catch fish in the coral reef. And reef conservation is also made difficult uh, by the lack of data. In the context of fisheries, uh, well, we can't manage what we can't measure. And this causes the lack of small scale fisheries management, thus hindering the reef conservation efforts. To make things worse, the users of coral reefs, in this case, the small scale fishers, are often disempowered or marginalized even. And this started the fisher cycle that declines our coral reef conditions furthermore. Now, to address those threats and challenges to coral reef conservation, uh, RARE has a program that is called Fish Forever. Now, what is Fish Forever? So, Fish Forever program aims to empower local communities using behavioral economics, neuroscience, and psychology. We work to empower communities so they have clear rights in using those reef fisheries resources through the establishment of managed access and marine reserve. Now, what is managed access area? So it's where an allocated area is given to the local communities to be managed. Why? Because they have managed and protected the area. They have exclusive rights. So the local communities have exclusive rights to fish in those areas. Since those, local, uh, those managed access, those area uh, is exclusive to the local communities, fishers from outside the communities are not allowed to fish inside the area. Now, the partner of managed access is marine reserve. Now, what is a marine reserve? It's an area where fishing is not allowed at all by anyone even the local communities themselves. Why? Because the marine reserve works to replenish the fish to the managed access area. Therefore, the marine reserve can help to ensure the sustainability of the fisheries inside the managed access and the coral reef ecosystem. Now, to support the establishment of uh, those managed access area and reserve area, we work to build community engagement so the local communities can manage their reef fisheries more effectively. We also work to enable fishers to adopt more sustainable behaviors toward reef fisheries. First, by becoming a registered fisher and by participating in the establishment of those managed access and reserve area. And then they respect the fishing regulations and protect the established reserve. Also, by recording their catch, the fishers can better manage their fisheries. In turn, we work to help local communities in using those collected data to make decisions regarding their fisheries. We also work to advance financial inclusion in fisheries households to counter those uh, fisher cycles of poverty and disempowerment. And we work to enact policy and unlock financing so the conservation efforts by the local communities can be sustainable. Now, allow me to share some stories uh, from the sites uh, about the impact that we've made by promoting reef conservation and fisheries management. Uh, first one in Kepulauan Seribu, the local communities in Pulau Harapan, Pulau Kelapa, and Pulau Kelapa II have established their managed access called Pengelolaan Access Area Perikanan, or shortened PAP. The local communities had an MOU with the National Park, with Kepulauan Seribu National Park, and they are making decisions using the fisheries data that they collected. The local communities themselves collected their own fisheries data throughout the year. Now, this adaptive uh, fisheries assessment and management process was completed uh, earlier this year. Now, moving on to Eastern Indonesia, uh, the leaders of Miami Bit Bay customary communities agreed, they met and agreed to establish a managed access and reserve area. Now, uh, the unique thing is, uh, in Maya Libit Bay, the managed access and the reserve area function not only to protect the reefs, but also to protect their customs and tradition as a customary community in Raja Ampat. Thus, in 2017, the managed access and reserve area was officially declared and named Kawasamperikan Adat in 12 villages in Maya Libit Bay. In the following 2018, the customary communities down in Pulau Batanta and Pulau Sawati in Jampir Strait also want to establish their own managed access and reserve with the same spirit. Uh, so the managed access and reserve can also protect their reefs uh, 
uh, where they usually fish and uh, and also the customary communities uh, in Pulau Batanta and Pulau Salawati. Thus, uh, Kawasan Perikan Adat was declared in 19 villages across Pulau Batanta and Salawati. Uh, the managed access, both in uh, Pulau Batanta, Pulau Salawati, and Mayaridi Bay are a collaborative effort from many stakeholders to conserve and protect the reef of Raja Ampat. Now, moving on to Central Indonesia and Southeast Sulawesi. Uh, one of Rare's motto is working with partners. So, we are partnering with local government agencies across 11 districts in Southeast Sulawesi to carry out the Fish Forever program, where we have started our behavior adoption campaign to establish, manage access and marine reserve. Uh, in Southeast Sulawesi, the managed access also called Pengelolaan Access Area Perikanan, just like in Kepulauan Seribu, and the marine reserves are called Kawasan Larang Ambil, or shorten, usually shortened as KLA. Uh, we've also started to carry out the behavior campaign to uh, record your fish catch. As shown here in the picture, uh, Para Madan uh, from Fisheries Agency of Muna District was explaining and promoting the benefits of recording your catch to fishers in Pasikolaga. And here we have Baefa, our rare staff. Uh, through our financial inclusion and gender integration program, we are working to improve financial literacy, facilitate access to finance, and enhance microenterprise. Uh, we, you, uh, you can see here in the picture, um, Eva was doing some site visits uh, uh, in Siang Tapina. Thing. Yeah. Collecting insights from women in the communities. So, uh, what's next? Uh, what is going to happen to our reefs? If we want to, well, if we want the reef to be protected and, you know, we, if we want to avoid the tragedy of the commons, then we, we need to work together. We need everyone's commitment to protect the reef. We need commitment from the high-level government to the local governments and implementing partners in protecting the reefs. And we need to involve the local communities to protect the reefs. Why? Well, because they are the frontliners in reef conservation and management. We need to protect the reef, not only, well, because it's beautiful, as you can see in Dr. Mary's presentation in this picture, but also because it has social value and cultural value. And it provides us with food, uh, food for our family and food for the future. Terima kasih. Thank you so much, Emil. Um, next up is Pak Nyoman from the Pakmaswas in Bali. Hi, Nisha. So, oh, hi. Masila okay, dulu. So, Pak Nyoman, Pak Nyoman and I will do it together, like a duet, actually. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Pak Nyoman, maybe okay. you can, uh, yeah, unmute. Okay. 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 Thank you, Nisha. Thank, uh, hi, Emil, and hi, Dr. Mary. Such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. You all, you all did really fascinating. Um, uh, we'll start to screen sharing, but we will have a duet with Pak Nyoman. And maybe it's a little bit slower than we than we think. So pardon for the language. Okay. okay. So it's on now? Is it on now for the presentation? Can you all see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. Um, hello. Um, my name is Ila. I'm from uh, Refshack Foundation Indonesia. Uh, I'm now as the uh, consultant for research program for uh, also for LSMO branch in uh, Sabusi and also some uh, doing some data management for uh, Refshack Foundation Indonesia. And today I will present that about uh, our work together with the community in our uh, site in North Bali, featuring Pak Nyoman. So he's uh, our local champion from North Bali, uh, working together with us. Uh, hello, Pak Nyoman. Maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit. Or say okay, hi thank you, Sila. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Nyoman. Nyoman Sugiyarta. Um, uh, 
uh, almost 50 years old right now. I started collaborating with uh, Ripcheck Indonesia, started, uh, started from 2007. Uh, I got a lot of things from Ripcheck Indonesia, like learning about coral, helping, and until now I become a diving instructor. And, and also we learn from uh, Ripcheck Indonesia. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not the educated person, but I got a tip now all with thanks to Ripcheck Indonesia. Okay, thank you, Pahyuman. Okay, okay, let's uh, show we start about it first. So, uh, basically, Ripcheck Foundation is in Indonesia is part of the Ripcheck International uh, that has a, the headquarters is in California. And Ripcheck Foundation in Indonesia itself established in 2005. And alongside now we alongside with the Rift Check Worldwide that are spread in almost 80 countries like Hong Kong, Malaysia, Australia, and and uh, and also uh, in Singapore. And we established in 2005, evolving from the voluntary voluntary based uh, conservation uh, movement in 1997. Uh, and also we have a three pillars of the foundation that. We want to work based on our science and technology, and also with education and our awareness. And the most important thing is uh, with the collaborative management or the community participation within uh, our uh, our work. And because we want to talk about uh, our site, our site working site in North Bali, uh, the place where Pak Nyoman also lives, it's called Seja Forest District. So it's our main uh, area of working with community it's on the northern uh, east of bali island uh, it it has a beautiful uh, beach uh, with a, a small pebbles beach we can say and near, nearby a steep hill so that's why people, uh, balinese people call it nyegara gunung because the beach itself is nearby a uh, steep hill and uh, the 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 beach itself uh, or the coral reef itself is uh, like a patchy coral reef um, uh, not very like fringing or wall, but you have uh, they have a patch of coral reef and sandy area in between, and also in a flat substrate in there. And we're talking about uh, reefs past in the past in the Tejokola sub district. That is Tejokola sub uh, district, or uh, also Bondalong village, has impacted with uh, impacted with unsustainable ornamental fishing practice because this uh, village, this sub-district is known for the beautiful uh, ornamental fishing and uh, sell it uh, for the market, uh, market. And they're using a cyanide uh, to, to, to cook uh, the ornamental fishing and it's degraded the coral reef within, within when they uh, uh, have this ornamental fishing practice. And also back in the in, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, cement, uh, cement for building a house is a very expensive. So many people in uh, Tejakala sub-district is uh, using the coral reef to, to build their house. So they uh, burn, burn the coral reef, they take the coral reef, burn it, and then smash it into like a powder and make it uh, for the cement, for the construction. And until the recent event, uh, um, Tejakala Reef is impacted with the bleaching for 2000 in 2010 and 2016, and it all has a domino effect. Domino effect that cause of fish biodiversity and fishermen says it, uh, the the fishes get a smaller size, uh, both in economical and demersal fishes, and then the fishermen need to go in further to for the fishing because there's no longer uh, coral reef uh, in their own area because it's all uh, damaged. Damaged. And it's also a fact that they have less income for coastal communities, not only for the fishermen, but also for like uh, tour, uh, for the tourists, uh, for the uh, tourists uh, working, something like that. And so, uh, Ripcheck came to Tejakula sub district around 2005, and then we tried to mapping the issues and checking the corals. Uh, how, how good is the coral is, we, we want to uh, survey the corals. And then that time uh, when Rift Check Indonesia uh, met with Pak Nyoman Sugiarta. 
uh, I remember that uh, one of the our Czech Indonesia founders met Pak Nyoman when he back from the sea uh, from his fishing activity and then our uh, one of our founders said what did you get and Pak Nyoman only said yeah just like this it's a it's a very very little fish not not so many fish and I just uh, bring it like this almost empty hand it's not worth at all that I'm going fishing uh, for long too long and but with this empty hand. and then uh, Richard came with an idea to ask Pak Nyoman to join conservation movement that actually your fish is uh, declining because your coral reef is missing nowadays. So uh, Richard started with a little ideas with with uh, give to give the person at that time with belief with the hope with uh, Richard hope and uh, what Richard uh, give at the time. Uh, and Pak Nyoman is one of the people that thrive. Uh, to follow the conservation movement since then and this is uh, the profile a little bit of Panyoman maybe also Panyoman can uh, explain a little bit of your history Pak okay thank you Sila okay we uh, like I, I've been uh, say in the form uh, I joined the, with the Rift Tech Indonesia this happened, we start to do like uh, Mantato surfing and then in 2008 uh, our um, local government start like uh, uh, makes our 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 ocean our coastline as the the area the uh, we, we call that local marine management area and then uh, we, I start learn how to dive, become a diver, and then I'm really proud with my son, to my son, because, oh, I'm a diver right now. And then we came to, to uh, uh, something in uh, under the water, and then <clears throat> this, um, not only at the time, but we do continue, continue, to be continue with coral and also with another, um, NGO and like uh, Coral, uh, Coral Ryan also and in, in, in 2013 uh, I got the uh, I, I win the winner uh, I asked the winner of the uh, Coral uh, Conservation winner and for 2000, uh, 2014 we start learn how to do reef check eco diver and 2018, uh, as the, we uh, I do cross to just before we uh, in the ADS, but and then uh, 2018 we start to uh, dive instructor as SSI open water dive instructor, and uh, that time I still uh, as a fisherman, but after that I. I I think we, I think I need to uh, to do the conservation with more concern. Then I start uh, stop as the fisherman, and uh, I do all of my time for diving as the instructor and also for the conservation. And uh, I uh, I feel so so lucky because uh, we join uh, I join uh, with the uh, Richard Nunsa and also we working together with another village here in Petakula uh, sub district uh, sub district and then almost uh, nine uh, village of. Uh, uh, nine coastal village in uh, Pula sub district. They, uh, they has like the uh, same like Gondalam. Uh, they has a local marine management area, and then we work together with uh, this village and also with the uh, rich Indonesia till now. Okay, okay, thank you, Panyaman. Uh, okay, and then don't jump into main course. <laughs> we haven't 
reach on the main course yet. So, so after after we finding Pak Nyoman to become one of the community that wants to involve with the with the work that we we want to work in the Teja Cluster District, we try to find a solution with the little steps and small steps with the baby steps to to involve the community to do to do the conservation. Uh, including like educating villagers of the uh, of the benefits of healthy coral reefs, coral reefs and also like taking this uh, taking the fishermen and also the villagers to do the snorkeling and even diving to see just how the beautiful the coral reefs are if they alive and how it will benefit them because it will uh, attract the uh, coral reef fishes to come and uh, play and then they can uh, they can use uh, they can catch it with a uh, with a sustainable fishing practice and also uh, learn monitor the coral reef like Pat Newman used to back in that back in that time, and also uh, doing a stakeholder forum to uh, uh, evolve them and also engage them to to start take care of their own uh, area. So that time uh, we uh, have a conclusion to make a marine protected area. Or uh, back in that time, the local community can say that the fish bag. It's just it's just a simple name to give. To the to the people, to the local people, just a uh, fish bank, but actually it's a marine protected area. And the fish bank itself means that the core zone where there is or is not take zone, so it it can be a fish bank at that time. And and yeah, we just uh we we want to working together with uh with the community because we want to conserve for our ecosystem and also uh manage the remaining pristine reefs area and rehabilitate the damage reefs in the Tejakola district that already uh, diminishing uh, from the uh, from the past uh, from the past from the past so and also we want to stimulate local community action that we, uh, we hope it will bring well-being coastal communities improve well-being coastal communities and also make it more sustained and now in the present uh, and also Bondong village already recovered little by little. I still have several damage because of the uh, uh, coral bleaching event back in 2010 and 2016, but it really has the potential uh, to recover. And government is fully involved in this moment. And also because in a Balinese, they have some, sometimes they have a local wisdom uh, that can play an important, uh, important role on creating law to be implemented by the coastal villagers or the coastal communities as we can see we can uh, we can see, uh, start to see a baby crawl and such so government uh, helping with the local community to make a regulation for their own villagers uh, when they need to come to the sea and everything and once again local community were fully involved of the from the early stage and as you can see, uh, uh, we we have a traditional sea garden, so the local lo local government also uh, facilitated to make a traditional sea garden. So, like Pak Yuman itself, he is the traditional sea guardian, uh, used to surveillance and monitor uh, the sea area um, to prevent there is a damaging uh, activity <coughs> for the coral reefs. And Pak Yuman itself is uh, also is the head of the traditional sea guardian also head of the pokmaswat itself and local community start to uh, evolve more start to want to do more and also it came with the idea to rehabilitate the their own area by providing an artificial reef or we can call it hexadome uh, that are fully made and self-made by the local communities itself and it's initiated by the community itself reef check a company for the technical activities, technical, uh, technical uh, difficulties during during the process. But the initiation itself is almost fully from the Panyaman and his team. And then uh, the conservation business unit that uh, people start to uh, helping their economy from this family by, pro uh, for example, like providing from the tourist for the tourists. Uh, like helping them to bring to bring their to bring the luggage and everything and also make uh like the snorkeling snorkeling uh ramp snorkeling ramp giran like something like that snorkeling giran and also 
uh, become uh, like a uh, guide uh, guide for uh, to the village. And then from from that time uh, until that locally managed area that just one from one village in 2008, it's becoming larger and uh, replicated replicated uh, replicated to other village uh, in 2009 uh, in the neighborhood village uh, and also from the local managed area and area, local managed marine area and then start to become a Buleleng uh, marine reserve or Buleleng marine protected area so all of these village already in connection uh, to do the to do the conservation effort and become bigger and bigger marine protected area and in just in just because in just from one village just starting doing it we just want the village in this very little place but yet impactful for the rest of the neighborhood village so this is the the map of the mps of Bulaleng uh, from uh seven village actually Tejokul has a 10 village but the one with the with the sea area is uh, seven village and the natural forest in itself uh, nowadays is uh, increasing but yeah well for now still threatened by coral bleaching uh, as i said before back in 2010 uh, the healthy coral risk degrading until five percent of because of that product but back in 2016 it can be until 50 percent uh, of the of the coral bleaching coral bleaching event that become uh, that that coral in Tejakula sub-district and conservation business unit is running uh, nowadays many uh, dive center that provide economical way, eco, uh, eco eco diving eco diving so uh, they also have the code of conduct for the for the tourists that want to dive in there and also this uh, dive center dive center also from local community and also pro, being supervised by the local government or the village government so it's very very good ways to involve them in a business unit that are sustainable as, as well and also followed by other environmental program like bank sampah or we can call like a, a garbage bank something like that and there this is also uh, supported by the local government of the Bondalem village and Tejakala sub district and uh, this is one of the uh and teams um proud of here because the artificial reef they they made is actually is a fully fully involved and fully made by the community and basically this uh this rehabilitation uh agenda is is uh, one of the menu of one of the conservation menu in tejak class sub, sub district and because this is what Pak Nyoman still doing until now? I think this is the time when Pak Nyoman can a little bit tell a little bit story about it. Pak Nyoman, can you give okay. us? Okay. Yeah. Thank Ini you, Sila. Yeah. The um, the, uh, the one I love for for the idea of the conservation to uh, so when we when I made. Mr. Jensi and he said uh, the idea is to to build a fish bank one one area maybe around one uh, ten percent of the coastal of the Bondalem Pilebi who as like a, a core zone and and we 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 protected the core zone with a little bit uh, strike like, and then. Let the, the coral and the fish uh, growing there, and then we can catch the fish outside of the core zone, like a, like a bank. The, 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 the core zone, like like a bank. This is the idea that's really, uh, really I I like, and then uh, we start trying. 2012, uh, Richard uh, gave uh, the community around nine uh peace stone and then it's look uh, working very well because uh, three or four days after we put uh, the water and then um, start coming uh like 
maneuver and then uh, ornamental fish they, they, they start uh, like coming like um, uh, the fish dome uh, is attracted the, 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 the fish for coming like that and and also for we waiting for one year maybe uh, this we we start uh, we start see the small uh, plant la coral uh, fungi they they they, they at at the surface of the substrate and and next year uh, next three months we do monitoring again and then start picking a bigger growing bit and then growing growing and in four four years it's been look like maybe more than uh, 10, uh, 10 centimeter for uh, wide like this and then I see uh, I think that's all oh, this is a very nice uh, uh, sutra and then that's why I choose them the fish dome as the uh, underwater sutra and also the when we uh, make the fish dome uh, more people uh, can walk in and then they, they can make uh, uh, small money for, for, for his family and and also I think that's that's the, the added value for uh, from the, the conservation because when we start the conservation I was uh, feeling uh, like a little bit afraid like uh, our fisherman also uh, why you uh, uh, close this area like that? As this before the, the area, the, the um, uh, uh, zone is as the uh, their place for for fishing like that. And and till now we still continuing to do that. And then uh, like so thanks to God also because. Uh, uh, more fishermen, they, 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 they start uh, doing our program and then uh, when for the first time they said, oh, this is not good for fishermen and then uh, uh, years by years they, they can, uh, uh, they can feel the, the benefit of them, uh, the conservation and then uh, they start doing. That that's, uh, uh, makes me uh, feel very bad, and also for tourism we 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 mix uh, uh, with the statue and this dome, uh, mixing with them yeah something uh, 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 safe like that uh, maybe uh, we, we we was uh, put a uh, um, statue and this dome and make. It one gate there just look uh, look so beautiful, but uh, but 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 what we uh, but what I I I need is the coral will be growing uh, better, okay. and also our people here start to understanding about that, uh, not not like when we we first and. Uh, fishermen say they, they maybe they feel a little bit afraid of uh, what what will I do here in 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 the in their area like that. But now everything everything is um, running good and also with the check we will still uh, uh, working for this. Okay, we, we also do uh, like um, uh, coral monitoring and then let's, let's look very, uh, uh, what's it, what? <coughs> that's, uh, for me doesn't look uh, very interesting and then, uh, and we start to come to the school and we talk with them. Um, with the school also, and we start uh, like 
the offer the one extra curriculum there in high school and and some student they uh, they feel interesting about that and then they join the, the extra curricular and we uh, we founding together with the collaborated uh, founding with the uh, local government and for uh, for choral education we we uh, we ask that from the uh, recheck because recheck is uh, uh, our partner still now and also we need them like that. We, we need the young generation. That's, that's, uh, I realize that I cannot do that uh, maybe in next 10 years, but the young generation, the young um, we have here in Bondalam, they will do what I do like that. We, we, we will be continuing. Uh, that's why I think we need them. We need the young generation. Okay, next. And um, last year, last year, some uh, student, like international student, and also company, big company from Kalimantan, they come to visit us here in, in Bondalam, uh, like the um, uh, study like study tour like that and then they, they're asking everything about what to do here uh how to do that how to do this and then i feel so proud of of, of myself uh, because they uh, oh I, I wonder, let me just small village but they uh would like to come to my village like that. that's uh like um, like another edit value though so for myself and for our people here. Okay, next. Okay, and uh, uh, this is uh, like a small, um, small fort, <laughs> like a small fish dome. We started this, um, at the future, we started uh, like a barabudur, and then uh, maybe, uh, Everyone can see this uh, start uh, small, small uh, coral start growing on it, and also the fish come uh, pulling uh, around the, the fish dome. Okay, Sila, thank you, okay, thank you very much uh, for all. And then uh, I just would like to say if, if we do for our mother earth and the mother earth will pay extra extra and extra uh, uh, for for someone who do that thank you terima kasih okay thank you Pak Nyoman. and so this is um our like closing statement from Pak Nyoman, uh, that also will be our closing together so well, but what I want to deliver that uh, the community participation is will be so much more uh, impact long lasting and also will demonstrate sustainable benefit uh, to all uh, aspect, to all aspects of ecology itself and also to the to the community itself, to the economy itself. So thank you, thank you again, Panyoman, for joining us and joining RevCheck, and also thank you all. Uh, I will get back to thank the you. So thank you, Nessa. Thank you, Sila and Pak Nyoman. Uh, um, with, with wrapping that up, let's get to our question and answer se uh, session. The first question is actually for Pak Nyoman from uh, Pak Derta Prabuning. And he asks if, uh, shall I do it in Indonesian for Pak Nyoman first? And then I'll translate in English. I think yes. Okay. Pak Nyoman? Sebagai masyarakat, bagaimana Bapak untuk tetap konsisten terlibat dalam konservasi? Bagaimana komentar masyarakat ketika Bapak terlibat konservasi? So, in English, is basically, how do you keep um, 
uh, being consistent and in working in conservation and how um, how what's the comment of the local community when you are um, part of a conservation project? Okay, uh, uh, for me that is uh, the choice. Okay. We can choose. Uh, we need to choose like uh, what we want to do. If we want to do the conservation, we have to do that with with, with full concern like that. And also, like uh, I, I would say that uh, we need to add the added value from, from the like uh, because uh, when we do consultation, uh, uh, like many many things will be uh, moving uh, forward also. Like uh, uh, when our coral is uh, start uh, turning better, and then the fish will coming, the fisherman will uh, getting this a uh, bit easier. No need to go far out, uh, and also. Like in like in Bali, we uh, Bali is a tourism island, and then the coral, like uh, uh, Dr. Mary said, there's a uh, uh, million of people in. Uh, we we can live from the coral like that, and then uh, the tourists will come in, and souvenir shop will going also, and then that is. Uh, like um uh what's uh, no, like the, the the added value of, of our conservation area and the conservation will uh sustain it like, will sustain it. Like that. I think that's it. Uh thank thank you, Banyaman. Um I have a question for Masila. Um, have you seen any changes since the establishment of that MPA in terms of like uh, fish stock or coral reefs or is it um, yeah. boosting up? So the coral, the coral reef itself, even there are the rehabilitation, but also the natural coral reef itself also has in, increasing by the time and not like very large uh, percentage. We have already also make the uh, make the presentation on it on the APCRS uh, back in the Philippines a few years ago. But little by little, uh, keep increasing. And also the the most shocking things is for the Napoleon race is come back to the come back again to the uh, Atejakula sub district. So it's been uh, gone like uh, many years ago, but. Uh, once uh, our fishermen called the photo, like, tell, tell us, like, uh, look, look, Pila, look, uh, Panyuman, we got uh, Napoleon race back again in our uh, in our colony. So that's what we can say, like, such a massive uh, massive changes in, uh, in the trading of MPA. And also the, the participation of the, the, not only for, like, the men, like, the, the local, like, uh, local people that working for the uh, marine tourism or maybe marine in the marine area but also that working in the land part like working for the land part they also uh, uh, want to involve want to involve about the uh, want to act, participate actively in the in the take care of the uh, or surveillance the marine marine area something like that so that's why uh, some people uh, join the local sea guardian as well to monitor and surveillance the the marine area like Pakyaman did. But basically, they are uh, they are not uh, working for the uh, marine marine work something like that. Yeah. Excellent. Um, this is a question uh, generally, I think, for um, Mas Emil, Masila, and Panyoman. Um, what is the biggest challenges actually in terms of approaching local communities that hasn't that's not really aware of coral reef conservation like how do you approach them to save it maybe emil can start first hello so well since rare use the behavior change approach uh, we are trying to make them proud of the coral reef ecosystem uh, we want 
we we were promoting that the coral reef, the coral reef uh, could be part of their identity that they can't live without the coral reef therefore well if you want to continue being fishers uh, if you want to continue to catch fish uh, and your grandchildren to catch fish then well you need to protect the coral reef that's the what simplest way to explain it thank you Asila, do you have any approach? Um, yeah, just with little steps that my, that the community might like. For example, because actually they want to involve sometimes. They want to take a part, take an action as well, but they don't know where to start. But maybe they can contribute to like a very simple step, like for example, uh, like we did in the Bondalem. Uh, maybe they cannot uh, monitor coral reef because we want to provide the coral reef data for the local government, but they cannot do the but they cannot do the coral reef monitoring. But let, let's say, oh, what you can help? Maybe I can provide with the boat something like that, or maybe I can provide with small stuff like a food for you to while you after diving and everything. And then after that, we have a little chat and we have a little conversation about what we do back uh, back there in the sea and thanks for you for your help for your boat for your food that we we can implement it well and then after that they they will start to think and they will start aware about oh okay this will benefit me as well not on not only for the uh, ecosystem not only for the sea but also for the me uh, or for my kids uh in the 10 years in the 15 years something like that Panyoman? Oh, yeah, the challenge is a um, lot of challenge for me. <laughs> yeah, but the first, uh, um, the first when when I start with the community also, you know, and the challenge is my friend, my neighbor, the fisherman is almost all is my friend. Uh, some of them is turning to be my enemy because I'm stop them to do. Collecting the stone, collecting the sand, uh, and also to, for the ornamental fish, the uh, the catching the fish, they use cyanide, and then yeah, I'm uh, yelling from the the beach, and then oh, stop, stop. Uh, that is my challenge for the first time, and for the second time, uh, like uh, I is. Uh, not an educated person. I just um, uh, put to sekolah. <laughs> I'm not past my my high school, and then I had to learn a lot about coral. And that's uh, that's why I say thanks a lot to the uh, Ritech Indonesia. And then, uh, but I had to to start the workshop and learn uh, more about because before like uh, like the other people here in, in my village i think that the coral is just stone and then we can do everything with them but after we uh, met the uh, big tech and then oh coral is a leaping thing and then wow it's a uh, this the new thing for me and then uh, also uh, the, 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 the third challenge is like you asked for me before that uh, how I can do conservation uh, sustain like uh, they could to be continued like that. That's why I start come to the school and then uh, trying to, to make an interesting story a little bit and then to attract them. Uh, and then to, to to make them feel interesting, and then okay, and uh, say thanks to the God also. This uh, some uh, student they come, and then we start to teach them about the coral, about our environment, uh, and 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 also I teach them uh, one skill that's diving, that's it. and and also uh, thank you to local government. Everything also with, with the community. Thank okay. you. 
Um, thank you, Panyaman. Um, my apologies for not mentioning uh, the one who asked that question is Sulistio Watiarkan. Um, the next question is for Emil, and it's from Arwan Drija Rukman. How rare maintains and strengthens the incentive systems benefiting the local fishermen groups to keep up their great work in doing coral reef system management? How rare maintain? Uh, well, as you can see, the this is uh, we have the Indonesian term for it. Uh, but that's that's one of the biggest challenge in maintaining and sustaining conservation effort. Ah, huh? giving the okay sign. Huh? That's right, right? There. That's why uh, rare not only works with the local communities. But rare also works with the government partners. Uh, we want to provide a more sustainable financing for the conservation efforts. Uh, that's why uh, one of the activity that we we are still doing uh, right now is to integrate the uh, the Fish Forever program with uh, Dana Desa. Dana Desa is a village fund. Mm -hmm. Just like actually, just like Panyoman, Panyoman, uh, Panyoman village, uh, Bondalam actually already succeed in that uh, because uh, they use a village fund to uh, what, uh, fund the conservation efforts, and that's what Rare is doing now in Southeast Sulawesi to integrate the financing uh, uh, with the village fund and the conservation program. Cool, thank you, Emil. Um, I actually have. I have a question for Dr. Hagedorn. Uh, um, is she still here? <laughs> oh, is she not here? I don't think she is. Well, okay. <laughs> um, I have another question for Emil. Um, what are the consideration? Um, what what are the different considerations that you guys make um, in order to establish or determine that this is a marine reserve? Well, first of all, uh, we need to make sure that it's where the fish uh, spawns or lay the lakes in a simple terms, or uh, whether that area is have the potential to recover and to support the larger area. Uh, that's why it's called. Uh, I think um, Masila's presentations uh, call it the no take zone, the fish bank, right? It's actually it's sort of the same. Uh, that's the first consideration whether it's a an area for for fish spawning aggregation ground, and the second one is whether it connects to other area through ocean currents, uh, whether those area can support other area and may hopefully supports each other. Uh, on recovering the coral reef. And then the third one, uh, this is actually one of the yeah, one of the most important one is for the local communities, all part of the local communities to agree on the marine reserve. Because sometimes uh, there are some groups in the local communities that got a little bit more marginalized, for example, like women's fishers group. Uh, sometimes the marine reserve, the no-take zones, they got established in uh, at where usually the women catch fish or, or collect shells, and we don't want that. We want the marine reserve to be agreed and established as inclusive as possible. Excellent. On that note, we've reached the end of our question and answer session, so I would like to thank all the speakers for all your presentation. It's super amazing and answering those very challenging questions. I work in a marine sex area as well, so I feel all your pain, people, <laughs> and all the challenges as well. <laughs> so, Panyoman, you're such an inspiration. I wish to have more people like you in the local community. And yes, yeah, I have to. <laughs> on that, I'll give this back to Ad America. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much to our speakers and moderators for today's session.
Earlier in the event, we asked our audience members a question. The following are types of coral reefs except, and the correct answer is option C, Amazon. However, unfortunately, no one was able to answer correctly on our social media. But thank you to everyone who has participated. Don't forget to tune in next time to get another chance for a shout out from us. Now, you may be wondering, how can I develop an awesome idea for a place like this? That's easy. All you need to do is go to our website at www.atamerica.or.id, select Create a Program, and click Collaborate with us. All event proposals coming to us will be reviewed, and your event might be featured here soon. You can also subscribe to our newsletter for all our weekly updates. <coughs> that wraps this episode, everyone. It's been fun, but we have to say goodbye for now. Follow our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at ATAMerica for all our event updates, fun contents, and so much more. Thanks again for joining. My name is James, and see you next time at the next At America TV episode. Bye!